inspires you and do you have a mentor? I'm not going to lie, my kind of inspiration was The Hills. I think for me, my dad, he really instilled work ethic in me from like an early age. And he has this saying that's like, five minutes early is on time, on time is late, and five minutes late is unacceptable. What would you say to people that have just started a business and they have friends or family members saying, can you do it cheaper or expecting that it's going to be cheaper than your normal rates? I fucking hate it. Your friends and family should be your number one supporter. You would never go into a expensive fresh and go, hey, I want the six course menu, but I've only got a hundred bucks. Where do I start when it comes to building my personal brand? Putting yourself out there is a little bit scary, but you have to start somewhere. People will judge you regardless. Mm. So either you stay where you're at mm. or you can go and grow to where you want to be. Yeah. They're not your people anyway. Which channel should I grow my brand on? You know exactly what I'm <laughs> going to say. TikTok for me. I know you're going to say something completely. What do you think you're completely, gonna You're going to say... Welcome to Top of Mind. Today is a slightly different episode because we are doing Q&A episodes that are kind of sprinkled in amongst the interviews that we're doing. Now, I'm really excited because I have Laura who works for me. Um, she works with us at Gambit Collective and she does. She looks after all of our social clients. So she is a social media account manager. Um, and I thought these episodes are going to be answering your questions. So we get so many questions on a weekly basis from our clients, from our followers, from our community. And it kind of got me thinking, you know, if one person is asking these questions, then the likelihood that someone else will want to know the answer to these questions is pretty high. So we thought we'd create these Q&A episodes where we're going to answer the questions that you guys send in or you guys send us, um, as well as questions that clients ask us throughout the week. Um, every episode we'll be trying to answer about five questions. So if you have any questions that you would like answered, if you are listening on Spotify, please use the Q&A function to be able to submit your questions. Um, alternatively, you can log on to the website that we have, the Top of Mind website, and leave a voice note there because they are lots of fun. Um, alternatively, just send us a DM at topofmind.pod on TikTok or Instagram. Um, but we're going to get stuck into it. Laura, welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. We have five questions today to get through um, and we're going to try and keep these episodes quite short because we know that people don't have a huge amount of time. Um, and I'm going to kick it off with the first question. So one of the questions that we had come through was who inspires you and do you have a mentor? So I'm going to ask you first. Now, when I first started thinking about getting into marketing and PR, I'm not going to lie, my kind of inspiration was the hills. Okay. Lauren Conrad working her little PR Teen Vogue fashion yeah. job. Since then, getting into the industry, I wouldn't say it's someone famous as such. Mm. I'd say it's colleagues, people I've worked with before, great bosses, because I think you can have bosses that aren't as great, but people that really lead, that show you, that mentor you, support mm. you at the moment, working with Gambit for a year and a half. I'd say you're one of the people that inspire and mentor me. But yeah, I just say people in every day that are doing awesome things in the marketing, PR, personal branding, mm -hmm. social media space, real people. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel incredibly uncomfortable with compliments and you know that, but um, I think for me, who inspires me, I think, as you said, you know, I've kind of grown up in an industry where, you know, there's been, I, I've always said there's like two types of women in the world um, and especially in our world, there are women that you know, inspire you and motivate you and go, you know what, you're really good at, at your job and I want you on my team. And then there's women on the other side of that that mm. are like, you're really good at your job and your light shines so bright that it's going to dim mine. They're threatened. And they're threatened and they get, you know, they squash you down. So I think there's really only such a small percentage of people that I can go, you know what, they really inspire me or they, you know, motivate me. I'd say, in the industry, um, someone that kind of stands out for me as an um, inspiration or I suppose mentor, so to speak, is uh, Rose Herseg, who is the CEO of WPP. Now, I had the pleasure of working with Rose through COVID and lockdown in a, in a role that um, I had there. And she was definitely one of those women that were like, you're great at your job and I want you on my team. And it kind of instilled in me that that's the kind of boss that I wanted to be and that's the kind of leader that I wanted to be to build other women up um, because just because someone is great at their job doesn't mean that you're less 
good at your job. But I would say outside of the industry, someone that really inspires me um, and is a bit, not a bit of a strange one, but it's my dad. Like um, he really instilled work ethic in me from like an early age, whether he knew it or not, like, you know, he was always the first person to be like, I'm going to take you to training when I was like competing and, you know, deep in sport. And he was always someone that was like, you're there, you know, five minutes early. And he has this saying that's like five minutes, five minutes early is on time. On time is late. And five minutes late is unacceptable. I've heard you say this before and I'm chronically late or (laughs) half an hour early. So I don't know what that says about me. If you love this episode, help us to grow and reach more people by hitting the subscribe button and leaving a review. But he, like, I mean, coming from a military background, right? Like he just instilled all of these tiny, tiny little things that are so important to maintain. And I think there's a huge part of what I do today that I think I've learned from him. So I think in terms of kind of who inspires me or who inspired me from an early age is definitely him. I mean, my mum and dad are both, you know, really hard workers, but I, I definitely think a lot of like my work ethic and things like that I've learned from him. A hundred percent. I could say the same with my dad. Mm. They instill it from a young age, mm. take you to work with them, show that they're working hard mm. and you want to kind of emulate that as well. Yeah. On to the next. Are you ready? Yeah. I have clients asking for cheaper deals. How do you navigate this as a business owner? I know you love this question. Oh my gosh. Honestly, cheaper deals. Like, look, the first thing I would say is that in our industry in in particular, we're the only industry I know of that people think that they can bargain with you on the rates. Like you would never go into a expensive restaurant and go, hey, like I want the, you know, six course menu, but I've only got a hundred bucks on me. Any chance we could get this cost down? Or I saw it here for 90. Will you do it yeah, for 90? Yeah, the restaurant's doing a steak for 20 bucks plus a beer. Can I get that here? And I just, you, I, it blows my mind. It's the same as, you know, hairdressing or beauty. Like you would never go to a hairdresser and be like, I've only got $50, but I want my extensions, my colour, everything done. And it's just like I, I really struggle to understand what it is that goes through people's minds to think that they can bargain with somebody's cost in our industry. Um, and we see it all the time. Um, but I would say as well that like if you – you know, are a, an owner of a business or you're in a in a business that you're feeling like clients are coming back to you asking for a reduction, there's two things that I would say. Number one, there is a Tiffany paperclip that costs $750 that people buy. Like they buy it because they see value in it. So it's like people don't obviously see the value in what they're investing in and that's okay. You need to focus on the clients that do see the value in that and you know, if you reduce your prices, you're immediately going to have other clients that come on board expecting those prices. So I think you need to focus on the clients that are seeing the value in what you're doing. And that might not be that particular client at that point in time, but 12, you know, 18 months later, they'll then come back because they'll be like, you know what? I worked with another agency. They weren't as good. I worked with a freelancer. They let me down. So I'm coming back to you because I trust that what you deliver is a value and I trust that what you do is good. So I'd say that typically when people try to bargain the cost down is because they don't see value in it. Mm -hmm. It's obviously half the reason that we meet clients where they're at as opposed to saying this is our cost and this is, you know, however much it costs to deliver it and that take it or leave it. We go, "How how much cash do you have to spend or how much cash have you put aside for marketing And then we go, what are the number one priorities that we need to tackle first and foremost? What are the foundational elements that we need to get right before we then start going, what are the nice to haves? And I think that's a really good way to look at it. If you are working with clients that are kind of bargaining down on costs, you know, don't dilute the scope scope of work. Instead, go, what is the priority that we can tackle for less? Get that done first. And nine times out of 10, people just want to taste Mm. of what it is that you're doing before they fully commit. So I do think that sometimes, absolutely. And at the end of the day, building a brand comes back to building trust and people won't part with a big wad of cash unless it's readily available to them. They won't part with that cash unless they know that they can trust that person. So give them solutions that allow them to just put their toe in the water and try it and then build their trust that way. Um, 
But I would say that if someone comes to you and says, hey, can I get you for cheaper or can I do this for cheaper, I would just say no. But what we can do is look at the priorities that you have to tackle. Let's start with that based on what you can afford and then go from there. And I'm going to throw in my own question because I know we get a lot of people asking this as well at That's a lot a of clients. Yep. So Rogue, special yeah. bonus question. What would you say to people that have just started a business and they have friends or family members saying, can you do it cheaper or expecting that it's going to be cheaper than your normal rates because they're a friend or because they're a family member? I fucking hate it. I'll mm. be really honest with you. Like I think that if you start a business, I mean, to be fair, I started Gambit Collective because I had so many friends that were in this predicament owning their own businesses that working with an agency was too expensive and working with a freelancer was too risky. So the whole reason Gambit Collective was born was so that those types of people can access the expertise that they needed at a pay-as-you-go rate, so pay for what they needed when they needed it. But it really pisses me off because, you know, your friends and family should be your number one supporter. Like they should be the ones and if they own a business, they firsthand should understand that, you know, you you're not going to be asking for freebies. And I think, you know, it would be if, you, if the shoe went on the other foot, me going to your business that you're needing help with, oh, can I get this for half the price because I'm your family or friend? Like, no, they should be your number one cheerleader. Like, They should be supporting you even more than absolutely. someone who doesn't know you. And prime example, like my ex owns a cafe. I know you know this. They're one of I, our clients. They're all the time. We're there all the time. <laughs> and, you know, people were really, really shocked that I still paid for stuff when I went in. Like... I still paid for my coffee. I still paid for my food. I'm like, he's running a business. I'm running a business. Like we don't give him discounts when it comes to us running his socials for them. And, you know, we don't expect anything back. Yes, we get the occasional free coffee, which we love. Or a cookie. Or a cookie, <laughs> which we also love. But I think at the end of the day, like the people, and, and I think also to that, there are people that when they ask for freebies, they don't appreciate it as much. And I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. So when I was in like the PT, health and fitness world, right, and you go, okay, cool, I'll do you and your friend for, for cheaper because there's two of you, right, they like they cancelled more PT bookings with me than the people that were paying the premium one rate. One. Because the people that were paying the premium rate were like, well, I've already invested in this, so I'm going to show up. Versus the person that gets a freebie or gets a discount – and they're like, oh, well, I'm only paying like 45 bucks for it. So it's like, like, what do I have to lose? So I do think that it holds people to account. Like, mm. and I think that it also, I mean, it's like natural selection, right? Like it gets, to the, it gets to the point where you're like, okay, if you're not willing to invest, let's say five grand, you want a branding package, you want a new logo, you know, you want the colors, fonts, all of that design for you, five grand. If a client's not willing to invest that, they're probably not a client that you want to be working with. Because the next thing that you do after that is probably build a website or mm -hmm. help them manage their social media. And do you think that they're going to have cash left after that? They're going to expect the same discounts or the same kind of exactly. special treatment And then you're forever. stuck in this hole. And I think that the only reason that I've been able to build the business in the way that I have is, you know, I've got this saying and I know I say it to you guys all the time. There's a difference between an easy 10K and a hard 10K. Mm-hmm. The difference between an easy 10K is a client comes on board, they know that they've got X, Y, and Z problems, we give them X, Y, and Z solutions. We tell them it's going to cost 10K, let's just say, right? They go, great, that looks good, that fills the need of what we want. Here, they see we'll the value. The invoice, no problems, done deal. Then you've got a hard 10K where you go back and forth with a client being like, oh, we don't really see the value in this, we don't really see, you know, what you know what you're going to bring to the table for 10k blah blah, blah. and you're going to take weeks if not months trying to justify that you're worth that 10k and in that time I could have pitched to like 10 other clients for an easy 10k so I think that there's you know I, I, I wouldn't waste your time you know what is it they're saying something like um wolves don't justify their opinions to sheep or something mm. like that like I think there's something like that I've butchered it, but whatever. <laughs> Google it. But yeah, I, we'll put it in the show notes. Um, I think, you know, if you're really set on what it is that you offer and the value that you offer, just like the Tiffany paperclip, like stick to it because if you're wasting your time trying to justify to people why they should buy from you, 
you're missing out on the opportunity to work with people that are already ready to work with you. Um, And it comes back to that old saying of like, you know, at any point in time in a business to business environment, 95% of people are not ready to buy at that point in time. Only the 5% are. So focus on the 5% of people that are ready to buy. Continue your brand work in the background that is going to continue to build that trust, that likability, that knowability. And over time, that 95% will convert, but don't waste your time trying to justify it to them there and then. And if they don't come back, they're not your clients anyway. They're not your people. Absolutely. They don't see the value. And there will be some people, I mean, like I say this all the time, my parents don't understand what I do for a living, right? <laughs> like they are not going to be the ones forking out five grand for a new logo when it comes to, you know, building a business for them. But they're not the people that I want to be working with. So I think knowing who it is that you're wanting to attract, knowing, you know, the types of people that you want to be working with and meeting people where they are as opposed to saying, well, I'm over here so come and get me when you're ready, going, hey, these are three solutions for you to work with us right now. Take it or leave it. And then that's it. And I guarantee you, like, we've had clients over the years where they've gone, oh, it's just too expensive for us. We'll go with a freelancer for now. We'll go with a freelancer for now. Mm -hmm. And then they come crawling back because the freelancer has fucked them over or they go with a big agency and they forked out 50 grand and they haven't seen the results that they wanted. Took out a loan. They took out a loan. Like... I had a call the other day with a guy that was contemplating taking out a loan to build his website because he'd been quoted 25 That's scary. grand. Terrifying. And I think that, you know, I said to him, I was like, look, we can build you one and it's going to be a lot cheaper than that. Comes back to the whole concept of minimum viable product. Get something that you need to be able to convert people and then build on it. You don't need all the bells and whistles up front. And I think that talks to, you know, meeting people where they are. So I think that's really important. But yeah, I think, I mean, there's so many people out there who will take advantage of a situation and will take advantage of clients. Um, And I just think, you know, if you're not meeting clients where they are at or acknowledging that they're not where they want or where you want them to be and walking away from it, you're wasting your time. Hey guys, if you are listening on Spotify, do not forget to give us a five-star rating. It will help us to reach more people. Okay. Question number three. Um, where do I start when it comes to building my personal brand? Now, you know that I was not a big personal brand (laughs) girl until I started working with you about a year and a half ago. When Laura started with me, she was like, I was like, what, what some things that you want to achieve? Like whilst you're here, like, do you want to work with a particular type of clients? Blah, blah. She's like, honestly, I just want to get better at LinkedIn. It's like, well, I, you're in the right place. <laughs> I don't think I posted except for that typical, please to announce that I've just started at XYZ. <laughs> My most hated. And maybe I think once I shared like a 40th birthday anniversary post or something like that. Mm. But when I started, my personal brand is something I wanted to get better at. Mm. Not only because I wanted to kind of grow who I was and who people saw me as, Mm. but also because I'm telling clients how to do personal branding and social media, but I'm not showing up Mm. with my own personal brand and on social media. Why would they believe me? I'm not doing it. I'm I'm talking the talk. I'm not walking the walk. Mm. So first I started with TikTok and I started editing my own Silly little TikTok videos, probably 2020, 2021. They're not silly, by the way. Oh, my gosh, they pop up now and they are terrible. My skills have gotten a lot better. But they wouldn't have if I didn't start back then. Same with LinkedIn. A year and a half ago, I started posting. I think you said to me once a week. Yep. Figure out what your pillars are. Yep. Figure out what you can talk about, anything you want, and post about that once a week. And since then, the amount of people that I ran into someone on the street the other day that I went Mm. to high school with, Hadn't seen them in years. Yeah. She came up to me from the other side of the road, crossed the road to come and say hi, yelling across <laughs> the road. I at first didn't recognise her. Yeah. And she was like, oh, my gosh, I look at all your LinkedIn content. How's this? How's the job? I don't think she'd liked a lot, Most if anything, yeah. but knew everything about my life because of my Instagram stories and what I'm posting on LinkedIn. Yeah. And she said, it's amazing what you're doing with social media. It's amazing what you're doing with Gambit Collective, working with Haley. knew everything about my life yeah. just from posting on that. And it's scary at first. Like clicking post, putting yourself out there is a little bit scary, but you have to start somewhere. Mm. And I think we were having this conversation on the phone earlier today. Like people will judge you regardless. Mm. So either you stay where you're at mm. Or you can go and grow to where you want to be. Yeah. And yes, maybe some people will judge you along the way. But 
where either they're going to see you mm. and say, oh, wow, and change their mind or they're not your people anyway. Totally. We, we, I mean, we spoke so about just it start. earlier. Just start. I think that's really important. Like where do I start is the question and I think starting is probably – the best thing to do like mm. don't overthink about it you know don't over engineer it don't you know get caught up on like is the content going to be perfect like am I saying the right thing like I think when like the advice that I give is like you know choose a channel first and foremost choose one channel because the amount of people that I see trying to do all the channels like the Instagram the TikTok the LinkedIn I'm trying to do them all and I'm creating content and then you actually end up doing nothing because you're creating all of this content and either you're a perfectionist and you're not then going to post anything or it's overwhelming because you've got four channels that you've committed to and, and you're not you actually post. delivering on any of them. So I do think if you are looking to start growing your personal brand, choose one channel and choose a channel that best resonates with what you enjoy doing. Like for you, you enjoyed editing videos. You enjoyed mm -hmm. shooting content of yourself and putting it out there. And so TikTok or Instagram would be a really suitable channel for that. If I hate recording myself on video, choosing TikTok or Instagram is probably not the best place for me to start, right? So it's like choose a channel that feels authentic to you is where I would start. Choose one channel, choose it, own it, go deep on it. And as I said to you, start once a week, like one post a week because that one post a week – it's going to be more consistent than the no post that you're currently putting up, right? And then just find something that you're really fucking interested in and talk about it all the time. And I think one of the questions we get all the time when we say talk about the same thing over and over again is like, won't people get sick of mm -hmm. seeing this same content over and over again? And I was like, number one, not everyone sees every post, so no. And number two, name any expert in a field of, off anything, whether it's someone that's really good at sport, someone that's incredible at makeup, a celebrity, like name anyone that is well known at something or in a particular area and all they do and all they share is about that one thing. But I would say as well, that doesn't mean say you're a footballer. That doesn't mean you can only post content or talk about football. No. You can talk about things that relate to that as yeah. well, that branches off. You can talk about health, gym routine, what you're training, mm anything like that. You could also talk about more of like a nutrition or kind of growing into the sport or yep. mentoring people in the sport, your personal journey. Like yeah. it doesn't just have to be, I am this. So I only talk about this. Totally. I mean, we talk about it all the time, right? Like you're more than your job title, especially if you're in that kind of corporate space and you're like, oh, well, you know, I'm a social media account manager and all I can talk about is social media account management and it's, it couldn't be further from the truth because at the end of the day people fall in love with people they don't fall in love with a brand and you know if we use football as this is an example <laughs> like how we got here I'm not sure but um, if we use I think football you said as sport and I just oh, went yeah. straight to football <laughs> <laughs> if we use football as an example like you know you might be a footballer but you might be really passionate about sustainability mm -hmm. or you might be really passionate about mental health and they're the things. So, like, choose a couple of things that you can talk about repetitively all the time. And I, it's one thing that I say is, like, talk about something that you can talk about unprompted. Like, what we're talking about here today, we can talk about unprompted because yeah. we live and breathe it and we do it every day. If I was sitting here talking about sustainability, I'd have to have a script in front of me because, yeah, I know, like, the basics, but am I passionate about it? Not really. So I think that knowing the things that you can talk about unprompted, like if you were given a microphone and you've got, hey, you've got 30 minutes to talk about this to an audience, what would you choose to talk about? Um, and have longevity in that as well, right? Like not just something that is like a fleeting or trending thing. No, I think that makes the consistency easier as well. And overall consistency is what's going to help build a personal brand. So if you can talk about it and you can talk about a lot of different things in relation to that one thing or those three pillars as we talk about yeah. with our clients, that's going to make it a lot easier. Yep. I agree. Amazing. All right. So I'm thinking about going to university for marketing. Oh, I love that. What would you suggest? Take me back to the university. Where days. do we start? Where do we start? I think I, I've had this question asked so many times on my personal social pages, but then also through Gambit's TikTok and um, Instagram. Do I go to university for marketing? 
I think there's two ways of looking at it. I think I went to university and mm-hmm. I studied marketing. So do I feel like that's a waste of time? No. But I think in this day, if you were to not go to university and you were to spend those three to four years working in an agency, getting the experience that you wanted, then that's fine. I think university certain op- – like the the university, you know, you have the little graduation certificate, it certainly opens doors. But there are other ways to open the door mm-hmm. um, that wouldn't be – just going to university I think it's different if you're a doctor or a lawyer and there's certain things that you know don't change over time but I think you know one of my girlfriends is currently at uni for marketing and she came over to my house a few weeks ago and I was listening to the lecture that she was playing and I was like Jesus what are they teaching you like or are they still teaching this (laughs) yeah that's what I mean and I think like with marketing and the pace in which it moves Mm -hmm. on it is so quick to turn over there's new things happening every week every day there's you know there's all new ways of looking at things whilst I think that there are some fundamentals with marketing and strategy and things like that that you can absolutely learn at university I personally think that if you know my child non-existent child was to come and say hey I want to go to study marketing my suggestion to them would be like if you can get your foot in the door in an agency or in a business that you want to be working in you're better off spending the three to four years there getting the experience doing it as opposed to going to university for that. I agree completely. I think it's almost, yes, there's a lot of value that comes from doing a marketing degree. I did one. But I would say that the main thing is do the internships. I think we had a subject in our last year. I did a four-year degree. In the fourth year, we had one subject that was go and do an internship. Yeah. And in my first year, I emailed one of the lecturers and I said, am I able to get university approval to start doing internships now and have that count towards this subject? Now, I didn't need the time and the hours to count towards the subject because I ended up doing four or five internships over that four-year period. But that meant when I went to apply for a job at one of the best kind of PR agencies that did PR, marketing, everything, they saw my five internships and they went, wow, she's got experience straight yeah. in for an interview. Yeah. So I think the marketing degree is almost a tick a box, unfortunately. Yeah. It gets you in the door and then it's about showing what you know, which you learn through experience. Totally. And I also think to that point, like with the university degree, it shows that you've committed yourself to something mm-hmm. for a period of time. And I think that speaks volumes. Like never have I Work ever ethic. had to submit my transcript from university. No one's asked. No Has one anyone asked you? And at university, I don't know where mine is. <laughs> at university, it kind of instill in you that like, you know, your results are really important. Mm-hmm. Like aim for that distinction and that high distinction. And like obviously the saying like P's get degrees. P's get degrees. It's really true because not a single person has asked for my transcript. And I'm or like, proof that I actually have a degree. That I went to university. I put it on my resume. No one's ever fact checked it, but no. s- still go and do the degree. Don't, yeah, don't, don't lie doctor about it. it but... <laughs> We don't endorse that at all. But I think, yeah, you're right. I think either – I think it's – for me it's more the commitment. Like as somebody that has hired lots of people in the past, for me it's more that like outline of commitment. So whether that is getting the experience in a workplace or getting the experience at university, I think it's that commitment to doing something for a period of time. And I think that comes back to the same thing around, you know, oh, you have to stay in the job for a minimum of a year. Look, if it's a really toxic workplace – get the fuck out of there. Mm -hmm. But I think the idea of staying for periods of time is also that kind of proof that you you've given it a good shot to something for long enough and you're not flaky. So I think regardless of whether you choose to go to university or whether you choose to learn on the job, committing to something for an extended period of time speaks volumes. I completely agree. And good luck to that person. I mean, good luck. Let us know what you do. Yeah, let us know which university you go to because Laura and I went to the same university. We did. Shout out, Charles. That's, that's university another story. Partners. That's that another, another day. Another story. We should do that. We should. Next episode. Um, last question. Which channel should I grow my brand on? You know exactly what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're going to say yeah. and they're completely different answers. Yeah. I think they both have merit. Mm-hmm. Uh, TikTok for me yeah. is Why? just because... It has the ability to grow so quickly. Yeah. The algorithm is so powerful. 
the opportunities in using kind of SEO, search engine optimization in your captions, in your content. They've just added a new kind of insight that you can look at what's trending and what people are asking to tailor your content even more. And authenticity is, I hate that word, but it's really celebrated on TikTok. You don't have to show up in makeup. Like some of my best TikToks, I have no makeup on at all. I've just finished at the gym and I've jumped on because I felt inspired to say something. And I think TikTok has the ability to create your own story really well, visually Mm -hmm. as well, I think helps. But yeah, I know you're going to say something completely. What do you think? Completely, you're going to say LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think, uh, I don't know. Like, I, I think it's a really personal preference, like the channel that you, that you choose. I and think it depends on who you are as a person, not necessarily your age at all. You don't have to be young to be on TikTok. Yeah. But I think it depends on your end goal and why you are wanting to build a personal brand. Yeah, I would say my answer to that question as to which channel should I build my brand on would be if you're an individual looking to grow your personal brand, it comes down to personal preference. Mm -hmm. If you like writing, spend some time on LinkedIn. If you hate making videos, LinkedIn is probably the best place for you. If you don't like taking pictures of yourself, LinkedIn Mm -hmm. is probably the best place for you. Having said that, you know, if you like making videos, if you like capturing photos and you know sharing that then I think Instagram or TikTok is the best place if you love just sitting down and recording and vlogging your life YouTube is the best place Mm -hmm. for that so I think there's it's a personal preference for that I think as a brand there's a next an extra layer that you have to consider and it would be where your audience is so if you're a b2c business that or like yeah that is selling to consumers I think meeting your audience where they're at, like if I'm selling this like very Gen Z focused product, meeting them where they're at, which is TikTok because Gen Z use TikTok more than Google to search things. Mm -hmm. So knowing that and being like, okay, cool, I'm going to show up on TikTok. That's where you need to be as a brand or as a business. So I think personal brand, it comes down to personal preference. I think business brand, you need to meet your audience where they are. And that doesn't mean just pick one channel either. I think pick a channel first that you really commit to putting your content together consistently. It's kind of your priority channel. And then you can adapt that content for other channels. You don't have to be creating completely different content, Mm -hmm. but just make sure you do have a presence if you're a brand on other channels where your audience are. Amazing. Um, that's everything. That's Wrap it up. Our first Q&A episode done. If you have a question that you would like us to answer, it can be about, I was going to say anything, but almost anything um, we will answer. Um, Feel free to submit it if you are on Spotify via the Q&A option below this episode. If you're on YouTube, pop it in the comments. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, feel free to send us a DM or leave a voice note from our website and we'll see you next week. Thanks for having me. Before you go, help us grow and reach more people by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a review. Yeah.